So, um, who are we? So, uh, my name is Thomas Roth, this is Josh Datko, and we have a third colleague who is Dimitri Nedospasov, who unfortunately felt uh, too cool to fly to San Diego. Um, before we start, we have some special thanks to Colin O'Flynn, just because he always had an open ear to us when we had any questions and wanted to clarify something. And also, he built a pretty awesome device called the Chip Whisperer, so if you're interested in uh, fault injection, check it out. So um, why are we here? So basically, um, we work with hardware security. And when we talk to people about the security design of their devices, they almost never consider chips as part of the threat model. So you talk to them, and they just assume that whatever the vendor says is true. Like, oh, this chip is secure. Don't worry about it. And uh, also, a lot of people think that glitching and fault injection is some dark magic. But turns out, it's really uh, easy. And we want to make this more accessible and make people try fault injection, because it turns out you can do it very cheaply, very easily, um, and yeah. So before we start, what is fault injection? So fault injection is a term that professionals use. We call it glitching. And so basically, the theory behind glitching and fault injection is um, we want to introduce small mistakes into chips. So basically, for example, we cut the power for a very, very short amount of time, think like 10 nanoseconds or so. Uh, we change the period of the clock signal, or even uh, we point a taser onto the chip and see what happens if there's a strong EMI shock. And the most common way to do glitching is called voltage glitching. And so basically, you, uh, you try to cut the power at a very precise moment in time to cause undefined behavior. And so the theory behind this is that if you look at a chip data sheet, it has this safe operating area. So basically, up to a certain voltage, it will run at a certain megahertz and so on. And what's very interesting is what happens if you go outside of this safe operating area. So you drop the voltage further, um, or you try to even go into higher frequencies with the clock signal and so on. And the basic theory in glitching is that you wait for a trigger event, then you wait for a certain delay, you glitch for a certain duration, and then you check for a result. What does this mean? Well, on a real device, this might be, oh, I'm booting this device, I'm waiting until I'm in the bootloader, and then I'm waiting for the precise moment where the bootloader checks whether the firmware is valid. And then I drop the power for a very short amount of time and try to boot my modified firmware. And so basically, if you look at flash reads, Flash reads take a lot of power. So basically, if, you, if a system boots up and it tries to read a certain variable or so from flash, and you interrupt the power, the result gets undefined. And if you boot a chip and you do a power measurement, you can actually see this pretty well. So in this region, this is just uh, the yellow line is the reset going up. So we start the chip. And you can see in the power consumption, there's a lot of stuff going on. So we can see that it goes higher, which is where the actual execution of the chip starts. And then there's a small part where there's a lot of power consumption. And this already tells you that this is probably the part where uh, the boot ROM tries to read something from flash, because that requires a lot of power. And then if we introduce a very short voltage glitch, which, whoops, for example, on a scope looks something like this, where you drop it for like a couple of nanoseconds, you drop the power. What happens is that this flash read might, depending on if you are lucky or not, uh, might get garbled and you get an undefined result and so so much for the theory but how do you actually do this and uh, that's where Josh comes in who will tell you how to prepare a device for glitching okay so this is our MLM so we're gonna tell these three steps and then we want each of you to tell three people and then I think there's a profit step in there or we launch an ICO I'm not sure we haven't figured that out but what we want to do is basically prepare the device for glitching. So we have to do some things, hardware modifications. We have to make some test firmware. Uh, so it's really simple. Uh, so if you're a hardware hacker, this is really simple uh, firmware. Uh, then, uh, if, then we just got to hook it up and glitch it. And those are the three steps. So preparing the device. <clears throat> basically, when we start looking at the device, we have to do some analysis of it. So we have to, we have to read the data sheet, and we have to figure out how the device gets power. So this could be, uh, so a lot of the microcontrollers now are, are pretty complicated. They have lots of peripherals, as other people have been talking about today. So we need, have to understand where power is going into uh, different parts of the chip. So main power could be 3.3 volts. Uh, the core voltage is going to be probably a little lower. If it's, it has a Wi-Fi peripheral, that could be at a, at a different voltage. 
And so internally, what's going on is there may only be, well, externally, there may only be one in input to the chip. There only may be 3.3 volts, but realize that all of these peripherals uh, are probably running at different voltages and maybe even different um, clock domains. So um, these have to get split out uh, through regulators. So, and again, depending on the peripheral that's being used, there may be more than one regulator. So the 3.3 comes in and goes to the core regulator um, that could provide power to the CPU core. The RF may have a different one. Uh, and then GPIO may also be running directly at 3.3. So there may not be a regulator in there. And so uh, this is, again, this is the reconnaissance step. And some of this may not be inferable from the data sheet. So some of this we just may have to make educated guesses on depending on the thing we want to glitch. But usually uh, a good design will have some sort of bypass capacitors. And this is to smooth the voltage out. And this is generally a good idea if you're making a product, you want to have these bypass capacitors. Um, and then these are external to the chip, and you'll, you'll s kind of see them placed around. But uh, what's also nice is that this capacitor may actually provide a direct link into the core voltage, which is the area you want to glitch. So this is perfect. This is like the side door entrance into the core, right into the CPU core. But we have that capacitor in the way, and that's kind of buffering this energy. So Pretty easy, we just do some hardware hacking, remove the capacitor, problem solved. And now we just have direct access to, to the CPU core and now we can provide that voltage. And so yeah, so now, so now this is the area that we're looking at right now. We can see that VDD core goes right in the CPU core and that's the, if we provide that voltage, that will be uh, a, a nice area that we can provide a glitching and capacitors are gone. So. We've got direct access. So on this kind of like NRF example board, we're trying to apply the, our MLM strategy. So prep one is uh, prepare, uh, prepare the patient, basically. Uh, so we have to remove these capacitors. We identify the capacitors by looking at the data sheet, doing some uh, other reconnaissance, and then we can just pluck those off. And so some practical issues if you do this, I mean, there's a reason these capacitors are there, but so by doing this, I mean, it could be a little bit unstable. Um, so this is just where you're in the analog uh, domain and you have to just kind of, you know, provide a nice clean power supply. And, you know, so if you hook up the power supply there, you will be basically um, providing that voltage that was there with the capacitor. So you have a nice clean voltage going in you've just replaced the like 10 cent capacitor with like a dollar power supply, but that's okay, it's not a problem. And yeah, that's exactly where we're gonna glitch. And so on, on a real, I mean, so, so that other slide just basically had those red things. Now this is like what it looks like in practice and we were just soldering one wire into VD core and that's what it looks like practically. And again, we, we take out these capacitors. So now we have to build a test firmware, basically, so this is coming at it from the attitude is I want to glitch this target. How do I go about it? Step one was this prep. Step two is building a test firmware. So we need to know that our glitch is working somehow. So we have to write some amount of code that will turn on the chip on, bring it up, exercise some function, and then provide a, a way that we know that it worked. So kind of in the like the uh, Arduino lingo, uh, the way, you know, here's the kind of like pseudocode slash Arduino code that would do this. Basically, we want to bring these pins up. Uh, right, so the boot the device, we just ignore all that stuff that happens before main, uh, and then magically we get the boot. Uh, we'll do like basically the system bring up, embedded system bring up. We are going to set uh, some GPOs as high, and this is going to be a nice clean trigger to our uh, glitching system, because uh, we'll have this nice rising edge. Uh, here we're going to read the flash address, so we have this flash address read, and this is the value we're going to corrupt, and then basically we loop around that, so uh, we just keep trying to loop around this, and then if we get a different, so this code, if we're running around it, should always work, right? Uh, should be always green. Uh, we'll see all the, f that should never fail, but by injecting the glitch, uh, this is going to, it's going to exit out of the loop, and so this is how we're going to know that this has succeeded. And so if you looked at this on a scope, right, uh, you know, the how, you know, what does it look like? And so, you know, the, the chip is going to boot, your pin is going to be low because it's booting. Then when that rising edge comes up, this is the trigger that you put in there. So that now you have a nice clean trigger spot. You have to program the delay of the glitcher. So this is one of the parameters that you're going to tweak with the glitches. Okay, where in this search space do I want to glitch? So you just delay this a little bit, insert the glitch, and then, uh, you know, then whether that glitch was effective, 
this kind of depends on that target. In that example that we showed, the um, right, it would see if that read failed and then possibly set another pin. But if you're trying to attack a live system or a real system, that's really going to depend on what the system does. But then this is, this is just the general algorithm for going through and how to glitch something. So now we need an actual glitcher. So what do we need for the glitcher? Well, we need some sort of device that uh, provides a very accurate, stable glitch. It has to be very precise, uh, you know, kind of like nanosecond level. Uh, and so um, we've got on board the FPGA train. And so this is the kind of, this is the tool that we're using to basically build the glitchers. And uh, as, uh, you know, as other people have talked about, basically FPGAs have uh, started to come down decently in price. So we're not using a very complex features of the FPGA. Uh, this is just kind of like basic digital logic. So these can work on low end FPGAs like the Lattice Ice Stick. What's nice about those uh, is that they also have open source tool chains. And so this is a very approachable uh, way. And then also there is the uh, icebreaker, uh, which is uh, another open source project. Um, and so it's also using the Lattice S FPGA. But basically you have that, you have this, the PMOD, which I'll talk about in a second. And then the power, power supply, which I've previously talked about, because you need to provide different voltages. So you need some power supply uh, that can do kind of custom voltages. But so here is the last ice stick. Um, it's like I said, open source full chain, approachable FPGA. Uh, it's more than enough to do this. Uh, the max PMOD. So I, I'm a big fan of the digital PMOD uh, spec for FPGAs. There's now a, apparently a ZMOD. So if you need more IO, uh, you can use the ZMOD spec, uh, which is totally overkill for this. You don't have to do that. But it's got like a 40 pin high density connector. It's super nice to geek out on. Um, but basically, and this is the kit that's in there, it's just an analog multiplexer. Um, it has three channel switching, um, and it's just, it fits in the nice PMOD format, so you don't have to do a lot of wiring. And so what the PMOD is doing is we need to basically insert the glitch, right? So what the glitch is, is you have, we have, um, we have that voltage going into VDD core, and we need to drive it to, to zero, and basically this, the multiplexer is perfect for that, because if you have these two inputs, and then you provide uh, the switch, it's going to switch the other one. And then that's exactly what you want uh, for, for kind of a glitch pulse. So there's other ways to do this too. You can use a MOSFET. There's, people have used uh, function generators. There's lots of ways to do the glitch. Um, as we are using a, a multi, analog multiplexer. And so the thing to know about the kits that you uh, got from the patio is that, oh yeah, thank you, Thomas. They have, uh, so like any tool, you have to make some, in, in trying to make the tool, there's some design decisions that have to be made. So some of, all of the channels are hardwired to ground. So you can only switch between one channel and ground. You, obviously, if you get the multiplexer yourself, you can provide any input to other channels. But on that PMOD, you provide one channel, the other one's hardwired to ground. And then there's three uh, resistors uh, that are optional. Basically, if you solder those resistors on, then uh, the result will go back to the FPGA. So sometimes that's not what you want because if you're, especially if you're doing high voltages, you don't want to put like five volts back into your FPGA IO. But uh, if, you, if you depopulate those resistors, it'll just um, act as like a bridge. Uh, I have been meaning to put this up on the GitHub. Uh, so you'll just have to take this audible uh, explanation of how that works. The essence is you can find the full schematics for the PMOD on our GitHub and it will explain you how to use it and how to connect it. And there are a lot of different configuration options to make it a bit more versatile. But the basic, the basic circuit is currently on the website that will just enable you to glitch in a couple of minutes basically after soldering it. Yeah, and then now uh, we have the uh, power supply. Uh, this is a nice cheap power supply, configurable via UART, uh, highly recommended. We hook it all up uh, with, uh, with a device under test is whatever we're trying to test, whether it's a dev board or an actual target. We have to get those signals back. Uh, so we need the trigger pin to come back into the FPGA, the success, success indicator, whatever that was. It's easy if you do your own firmware. It may be different if you're trying to act, uh, attack a real device. Um, so you need, need the, that to come back. Then you have the multiplexer coming back for the different voltages. Uh, then you have to provide the enable signals. And so, yeah, so this is, it starts to add up. And a lot of the practical problems here, which I, I know at least I've had a lot of frustrations with, is that, you know, you, you, the, a lot of the wiring, it becomes tricky. So, like, when it's not working, you just kind of have to go through each of these wiring. That's why we have that PMOD MUX. Helps cut down some of the wires. But you can totally do this on a breadboard. It's just that when there's a problem, you now have to go through each wire. 
Um, and then you have the power supply. And so, yeah, this is what it looks like when it's all hooked up in a big mess of wires. So the actual glitcher, um, again, we're using these FPGAs. This is super uh, great. This, like I said, I really am a big fan of that PMOD connector. I uh, previously was not a big fan of 3D modeling, though. So I was like, PMOD connector, check. Make a PMOD, no problem. Put them together. Uh, I didn't really consider what happens when you put these two together, because you end up with a device that looks like that. Right? So you kind of have this L-shaped glitcher. Uh, so you should do 3D modeling. It's like a thing. Uh, and it'll prevent you from making weird L-shaped glitching devices. Um, yeah, and so now we're ready to glitch. Yeah, so basically we now just walk through the theory on how to, how to build a glitcher. And um, the idea is, if you want to glitch, the, the real trick is to find your, your glitch parameters. You need to figure out after your trigger event, which might be, oh, I turn my Xbox on. And for example, the Xbox mod chip is a glitcher that just tries to glitch the Xbox CPU. And so uh, that would be my trigger event. And then a certain delay after I turn the device on, I want to glitch for a certain amount of time. And finding these parameters is the real trick. So as you've seen before, we have the trigger event, and then we have the delay and the glitch. And the delay we require might be 200 nanoseconds, it might be 10 nanoseconds, it might be 20. And our glitch pulse might be very short or very long. And so what we have to do is we have to write a device that tries to tries each delay there is and tries each glitch pulse there is and then checks for success. And so um, the problem is if you do this on FPGA and you write your own software for it, it becomes complicated really, really quickly. And so we decided to use something pretty simple for the host control, which is Jupyter Notebooks. So we provide a Python API to the glitcher that just lets you very easily automate the glitcher and implement your own success checks. So for example, if you glitch a chip to re-enable the debugging interfaces, you might want to build a, a short script that just checks if JTAG is enabled. And integrating this into a big software is kind of a pain, so we just use Jupyter Notebooks that let you write your own success function in like 30 lines. So for example, if we take our glitcher for um, a chip you're about to see, it's just like 20 lines. So basically all we do is we tell the chip, hey, we want to restart you for a certain amount of time. Then we iterate through all delays that we want to try. We iterate through uh, all the pulses, all the pulse length, the glitch length we want to try. And then we actually glitch. And then all we have to do is check whether our glitch was successful. And so, for example, in this case, uh, with our test firmware, we just check whether a GPIO was brought up, whether we broke our own test firmware. But if you do this on a real device, your success check can really be anything. So it, as I said, it might be a JTAG check. It might be a check whether, oh, my Xbox is now booting my own games or whatever. Um, and then we just say, oh, yeah, we were successful. And so how does this look in the wild? So if you build this and you eventually have a stable glitch range, um, you simply run it, and then you get some nice progress bars. And after a couple of seconds, depending on how stable your glitch is, you actually uh, get a success indication. So in this case, the glitch takes like, I don't know, 20 seconds or so to execute. We were successful. But yeah, this doesn't really give us anything because all we did was put up an I.O. So what's really interesting is when you start glitching real targets. And so what we did was basically we looked at the processors we find in common IoT devices. And so our goal was to, to take a look at the modern processors that people are using in new designs and the new chips that promise new security features. And so the chips we tried and evaluated as part of this was the NRF52840, which is a Bluetooth uh, chip that you find in a lot of variables. And then the ESP32, that's almost in every second Chinese IoT device, basically. Um, and then the SEM L11, which is my personal favorite because it's a secure microcontroller. And the STM32 uh, F2. And so our goal was to configure these all in real-world conditions and test the chips in situ. And so because we just have 25 minutes, we're going to skip over the boring chips and go right to the highly secure microchip SEM L11. And this chip is world-class secure, like <laughs> I tell you. It's the winner of the best contribution to IoT Security Award. And just if you search for security on this site, it's 57 <laughs> secure. Like, this is a secure chip. 
And so if you actually read the data sheet, um, we talked about the different power domains earlier. And basically we said, oh, we just glitch V core, right? We go behind the regulator. And the problem is if you read the data sheet, it actually has this special section. Oh man, we have a brownout detector on the 1.2 volt line. It's been calibrated in the factory. Don't touch this. And so I was a bit scared that we might not be able to attack this because yeah, there's like this dedicated V core brownout. And so um, can we glitch it? Well, um, the real problem was I started glitching this chip and then I was pretty sure I messed something up because I got success after literally five minutes. <laughs> so I was like, oh, did I misconfigure the firmware? Did I mess something up? Like I was mind blown, right? So what do you do with this? Well, um, microchip provides this secure UART bootloader for the L11 and so we can fully bypass this uh, very, very easily. Um, but that, for me, brought up the question, how easy is this to glitch? And so if you couldn't tell by the dialect, but I'm German, and uh, I live in South, South Germany, and we are very, very cheap. And if we look at the price of glitcher, like one glitcher is like nine beers at Oktoberfest. <laughs> That's unacceptable. And so the goal was, what if we take the most secure chip there is from microchip, and the cheapest chip there is from microchip, and we use the cheapest chip to glitch the most secure chip. And so that was how the $5 glitcher was born. And so all you need is an AT Tiny, which costs like, I don't know, one euro, two, uh, $1, $2, and the kit that you actually get for free, so it's actually the $2 glitcher today. Um, and then at the price for one pretzel at Oktoberfest, <laughs> you can glitch this chip. So. Um, that's pretty awesome, and it just takes like 130 lines of AVR assembler, undisclosed amount of beer, and uh, then you end up with a mass of wires on your desk that is able to fully bypass the secure reference bootloader for $5. And so this brings us to the next chip, which is the STM32F2, and Josh will... Okay. So uh, we, last year at CCC, uh, to talk wall that fail, we sh talked about the STM32 F2. Uh, so with the time remaining, this one's gonna be a little quick because you can go watch the wallet. Dot, you go to wallet.fail, which is also a website, and you can watch that uh, presentation. Um, but yeah, there's lots of previous work. Uh, the STM32, in this case, is used in a Bitcoin hardware wallet. Don't worry if you're triggered about the word Bitcoin. I'm not going to get into all those details. Uh, but just know that people are storing millions of dollars on STM32 F2. And if you search, so the, the uh, L11 was 57 times secure. If you search security in this data sheet, you don't find anything. So this is obviously the chip to use for cryptocurrency. Um, now, in this case, basically, the, we're bypassing the readout protection. If uh, readout protection two is set, basically in, in flash, it's gotta be this value CC. If it's zero, it has to be this. If it's neither of those two, you're in RDP one, which sounds, if, it's, if that sounds horrible, then you have the right intuition because if we just need to flip one bit and then we can get a RDP two to RDP one downgrade. And uh, that, that's exactly what we did. And so here, uh, that, that value is being read out from the boot ROM. And so we do, we reset the chip. It goes into the boot ROM, the boot ROM runs, it's going to read this value. Then it'll eventually launch a user code. We are inserting, uh, you know, so the, here's where it's read, so that's where we want to insert that glitch. Um, and, and then if we can flip that one bit, we'll go into RDP1. And so we've seen variations of this picture, but this is basically that same setup, FPGA, the MUX, uh, the Trezor uh, cryptocurrency hardware wallet. And this is, uh, you know, we're scripting this with Python, so the host is controlling it. So let's see um, how this works. And so this is me, uh, this is us running the uh, thing. And so as it's running, it's searching through that space. So Thomas showed that graph of, the, uh, of it sliding around. That's exactly what it is. The first column there is delay in uh, clock cycles. And then bam, they we're in, right? So yeah, so this is, uh, so now it's downgraded. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, so if a chip stores uh, lots of money, then if you do this, then you get the money because that's how the, the, the seed is stored. So well, there's still some uh, exploitation steps that we have to do. Uh, we got to read SRAM, do a lot of that uh, stuff, but you can look at wallet.fail for that. Uh, we made this glitcher a little bit elaborate for this. I have some of these boards if you want to try this socket. Um, there's some issues with them, but I can, I'll, again, audible instructions, I'll help you work it out. 
uh, but we just kind of automate it into one. And uh, yeah, so chip.fail has uh, basically all the GitHub uh, source. Uh, it has the, p the schematics for the PMOD that you, you guys have. And everything else that we've open sourced is on, on there. So that's the thing. And yeah, I think that's any, that's, that's all we have. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, as always, you can find them in the patio if you have additional questions.